Welcome to the Clear Admit MBA Admissions Podcast. I'm Graham Richmond, and this is your Wiretaps for Monday, August 5th, 2024. I'm joined by Alex Brown from Cornwall, England. Alex, how are things going this week? Very good. Thank you, Graham. So it's still Olympic fever here in Paris. Um, there's been, uh, you know, it's, it's it's great. They've set up these giant screen TVs in a lot of the parks so that if even if you can't go to the events, there's a nice sort of camaraderie. Uh, last night, there was, a, I guess, a football match on. Uh, I think it was the French women's uh, team playing somebody and, you know, you could, you know, just really great vibe in the park and they have little huts selling beer and, be- and other beverages. And so it's kind of a nice, nice thing so far. <laughs> yeah, I've been following the Olympics. You have a real star in the swimming pool in France. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's been kind of cool to see because that was kind of unexpected. And yeah, there's been a lot of, you know, good moments so far. We'll see how it all. <laughs> he, he seems more popular than Kylian Mbappe. Is that correct? <laughs> Mbappe, <laughs> I would say, well, especially given France's performance in the in the Euro Cup, uh, I would say that's fair. Yeah. So, um, yeah. In any event, it's been it's been crazy to have the Olympics here in Paris, um, but it's also you know it's it's the city's pretty vibrant. Uh, most of the Parisians are not here, by the way, <laughs> but it's mostly people have come from elsewhere. Everyone else is you know all the people who live here, I think, are on vacation or something. <laughs> um, what's going on in the NBA world? Yeah, it's very quiet on the wires. Um, at this point, I think we, yeah, the, the odd person appears to be getting off wait lists, but we're getting very close to sort of preterm. I assume Wharton's preterm is pending um, this week or, or whenever, because it's usually quite long. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, the one or two people will hear, um, but we are definitely in, in the midst of sort of ramping up for next season. Um, yeah. And, and so forth. Application deadlines. I mean, it's we're recording this 1st of August, Judge will be first out of the gate towards the end of August. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, no, things, things are switching over. Yeah, and you now have reminded me something that I never knew when I applied, and that is that preterm or orientation for these MBA programs often begins many weeks before the first day of classes. Yeah. And I had no idea. I think I showed up at Wharton. I mean, they, I, I knew once I was admitted, but so I, I ended up showing up at Wharton, I think it was like almost three weeks before the first day of classes. And you have all these amazing activities, and it's kind of like school without you know, real consequences or homework. And so you're, you're taking some classes to get ready for the curriculum and and there are all these crash courses and things, but it's, it's just a lot of fun Yeah, because you meet your classmates that, you know, these kind of learning team retreats. And so that's just something that I not, I'm not sure everyone knows about. And also you get to move into, if you're arriving in a new city, you get settled, set up your bank account, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, just keep that in mind. If you're applying to business school, you, you actually wouldn't be, you know, showing up in the city on the first day of class. You need to kind of get there earlier. And uh, most schools have really great orientation programs. So, uh, and I think some, some, some of these programs are a little bit optional but I would absolutely encourage folks to attend the full preterm because it really sets you up so well to for the beginning of the overall experience Um, so yes I didn't. I didn't have an option. They made me go to the math boot camp yeah. for Wharton. <laughs> As they said, you studied art history. You, you get here early, okay? <laughs> um, so that was that was worthwhile, though. Um, one thing I should mention is we're taking a bit of a break with our events. Like we just finished the big event series, our webinars and stuff that we've been doing. Um, but there is the the next set of events is already on the horizon in September. So stay tuned. This is not public yet, but we're going to do three events after Labor Day in September, and we have 15 leading MBA programs taking part, including, you know, the likes of Columbia and Wharton and Yale and Tuck and Tepper and Duke. And there's a whole list here. I won't go through it. But anyway, so stay tuned for more on that. Uh, It should be fun. I had a great time doing the last batch of events this past month. So that was fun. Yeah, no, very good. Very good. Uh, In the news category, Alex, I don't know if you saw, but Harvard Business School uh, received its uh, designation as a STEM MBA program which means that non-U.S. citizens who complete the program can stay and work in the United States for up to three years now without needing a special visa, assuming their job is, you know, can also be characterized as, you know, uh, quantitative and STEM oriented. Um, but so what do you make of that? I think it's absolutely brilliant. Do we have a resource on Clear Admit that lists all the STEM designated 
um, top MBA program. I know we talked about this. I think we might. I'd have to go back. I thought there was an article where we kind of listed them out. I remember, you know, Rochester Simon was like the first MBA program to offer that, yes. um, which is really cool. That was several years ago. Uh, I think it's it's telling that HBS has done it and that most of the top programs now are STEM as well. But I think we need to figure that out and make sure our, if we do have an article, make sure it's current. If we don't have an article, let's get one out yeah, yeah. because I think this is really important. Yeah, great idea. So I'll talk to the team if we if we don't have one off to check. Um, the other big news was um, Professor Jennifer Chapman was appointed interim dean of Berkeley Haas. Uh, their past dean stepped aside after a five year um, stint, and you know basically she's really well known for research into organizational culture. Um, and so she's uh, this is kind of interesting, right? Because here's a professor at a top business school who studies organizational culture and, you know, kind of human uh, resources and things like that. And now she's going to be in charge of, you know, kind of running the show. So that'll be kind of interesting (laughs) to see how it goes. But my understanding is that the faculty and administration are quite excited about this. She has a lot of fans on campus. And the other thing that's funny is that the current chancellor of Berkeley overall, the entire university, is Rich Lyons, who used to be the dean of the business school for many years and is really well-loved. So if you're working at Haas, you're happy because from the top of the university down, it's like all, you know, Haas people. So um, so probably some happy people within within the Haas uh, <laughs> uh, group. But what, yeah, I don't know if you'd, you'd heard about this. We did a little article on it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's brilliant. And I think she should be very good at it role and having you would think right <laughs> yeah and having an ally further up the organization is always going to be really helpful yeah definitely um the other thing we did run a couple more admissions tips or admissions resources one of them is just how to make the most of a campus visit so if you are planning to get to a, a campus and check it out read that um it'll help you to you know just get a lot out of your time there we also did this great sort of chart with all the early and round one deadlines um which we were talking about as a team the other day in, in the clear admit meeting that that's up and it's just great to see it's it's you know organized chronologically and we not only list when a school's deadline is but we then list you know when you're going to hear back uh, we also have links to the analysis of that school's essays in this chart and also a link directly into the school's online application. So pretty good resource that's up on the website as well Alex. Very good. Very good. Uh And then before we get into our candidates, I did want to mention we continue to do these admissions director Q&As. So I have a couple of tidbits I wanted to share. We caught up with Donna Swinford over at Chicago Booth. Donna is one of my favorite people in this industry. um, And this is because she is a massive baseball fan. She loves the Chicago Cubs. And so we often talk baseball um, when we're hanging out. But she did an admissions director Q&A. And we asked her, how do you approach the essay portion? And, you know, what advice do you have? And she said, and this is really important, Alex, because their essays are a bit different. And she says, our essays are fairly open in that they have no word max. You are free to use the space how you see fit. You might recall, Alex, they have a minimum word count of 250 for their essays, but no maximum. And she says, that doesn't mean (laughs) we need you to write a novel, But do take advantage of the opportunity to be yourself and to shed light on why this is the next step you want to take in your professional development. Don't be afraid to dig deep internally. This is often a learning process for people, and they uncover a lot about themselves. We want to know what inspires candidates and how that influences their MBA paths. It may be helpful to have someone else read through your essays and to tell you what they take away from it. Getting an outside perspective on your own words can be very insightful. One other piece of advice I would give is to make sure that you are directly addressing the prompt or question as opposed to using the essay as a catch-all for everything you want the admissions committee to know about you. So what do you make of that, Alex? I hate it. <laughs> oh, I mean, on. you're going to get candidates for sure, but <laughs> just give me a limit. Give me a constraint in which to write the response to this prompt, and they'll just be really anxious. So, I mean, I think that the... the the, 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 the advice is, you know what the average length of other top MBA essays are. Just use that as a sort of general constraint. So I, I actually, yeah, we had Donna on one of our webinars, I guess it was like two weeks ago, about the essays. And I asked her that exact question because I said, isn't this a bit challenging? And does anyone submit like 
a novel. A book. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she said, she sort of, um, she said, people don't submit books, but she said, look, most essays end up being in the, I think she said five to 700 word yeah, kind of range. Perfect. So, so I think if she's saying that, that's a little bit of a hint. And she does say in this quote here, you know, d- don't, we don't need you to write a novel. So, <laughs> um, so there you go. A novella. But her other advice is pretty spot on. I yeah, would yeah. Say. No, I, mean, really I think it's good. good really. I mean, I, I believe I remember Donna from way back in my time. Yeah. Yeah, she's, you're right. She's been there for a little while. Um, we also talked with uh, Justin Ayer, who is at Boston College uh, at the Carroll School of Management. And I asked him, uh, well, actually, Lauren on our team asked him, tell, tell us briefly about two popular courses at your institution. And I, I, I picked this, this tidbit to share out because I thought you would find it interesting. So he said, a popular recent course is Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence, taught by Professor Peter Vanderwerf. This elective, which builds on the core Data Analytics 1 course, equips students with advanced tools for applying machine learning in a business context and includes a hands-on final project that uses real corporate data. He then said another popular elective is Business Analysis Survival Guide, taught by Professor Peter Strepp. The course teaches students how to ensure the success of IT and software projects through effective requirements gathering, wireframing, and understanding agile methodologies without requiring any coding experience. So Alex, the reason I I kind of shared this is because I think it shines a light on something that's fairly unique about Boston College's MBA program, which is that it's data first and very heavy, um, kind of tech friendly, quant oriented. And I just thought the fact that the two courses that he selected as being really popular sort of really demonstrates that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And they better have some great faculty because to teach that machine learning stuff is not trivial. I'm actually... Um, doing a little bit of work myself in R and R studio, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be showing students, uh, you know, doing a K-means analysis on some data, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, I mean, obviously they they must do it really well because they say it's a really popular course. Um, yeah, I would yeah. like to take it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then the final admissions director that we caught up with was Jennifer Zhao, and she is from Siebes in China. And this I just thought would be interesting because I think some of our listeners know less about their program. And, and so I picked the question that Lauren asked her, which is, what is one aspect of your program you wish applicants knew more about? And Jennifer said, Siebes MBA program distinguishes from other top business schools with its unique feature of blending international exposure with strong Chinese market expertise. While offering students immersive exposure to global business topics, the program enhances students' understanding of doing business in China through extensive academic and experiential learning opportunities, including China-specific cases, China modules, integrated uh, strategy projects, and a thing called China Discovery Week. The in-depth knowledge and experience not only strengthen students' understanding of the Chinese market, but also equip them with practical skills that are highly valued in the global business environment. So yeah, obviously, if you're interested in doing business in China, Siebes is a great place to be, right? I mean, there, I can't think of another place that you would want to be, right, besides Siebes for that. So um, it's great great that she's underlining that. Yeah, no doubt. But I'd also, I'd also say if you're really interested in um, social media, um, then they probably they've probably got some really interesting coursework in that regard because a lot of the trends we see in the West started in China. So live streaming, mm-hmm. key opinion leaders, you know, the, the whole sort of advocacy stuff, um, social search that all started in China. Yeah, um, yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. So, um, so that we'll keep those coming. There's still more. I know. I just saw one come in from IMD. That they're coming in from schools. So there are going to be more of these admissions director Q and A's coming your way. Uh, on the podcast, we continue to release those little short mini episodes that I've recorded out in New Orleans at the GMAC conference. I think we most recently had uh, Eddie Aspie from Cornell, uh, which should be in your feed now. And by the time you listen to this, I think another one will have come out, which is Laurel Grodman over at Yale uh, School of Management. So um, definitely check those out. There's still more to come. I think there are a handful more that we recorded. So those will just continue to flow out. 
Uh, other than that, if you want to reach out to Alex or me, you can write to info at clearedmit.com. Use the subject line wiretaps and we will write you back. We continue to get some communication from even veteran listeners. Alex, you probably saw we had a nice email from uh, Cap. I don't know if you remember Cap from last year, but yeah, so we still get emails from folks and yeah, it's just love keeping in touch with people as they go through this process. Uh, Alex, anything else before we start talking about this week's candidates? Let's get going. All right. So, you know what? I'm going to need to, uh, <laughs> this is like a classic thing, Alex, but I somehow I'm looking for the wiretaps candidates and I, I had them on my screen. So we're, we're just going to roll with it. But, <laughs> um, but this is wiretaps candidate number one. So our first candidate has just three schools on the target list. And those schools are Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton sometimes referred to as the trilogy. (laughs) Um, This candidate is uh, a British doctor, um, or at least lives in the UK, and I think grew up in the UK, so I'm assuming British. Um, They mentioned they were born on an island in Europe and then moved to the UK when they were younger. Uh, So this person, a medical doctor, um, but then left the medical profession um, to join, uh, I believe it's McKinsey, uh, and basically worked at, has been working at McKinsey and now wants to go to business school with the idea that they'll get into VC. Um, they're really interested in kind of healthcare related VC. So in terms of the numbers, they have a 326 on the GRE. They have a 4.0 GPA. Alex, I was kind of wondering, I don't know if you had more information on this, but I was sort of wondering, is that you know, I, I presume they went to school in the UK and there is no 4.0 in the UK. So I'm guessing they maybe have like a first class honors, which would be sort of like a 4.0, I guess. Yeah, that's um, what I would assume. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll kind of stop there. But what do you make of this candidate? Because it's an interesting profile. Um, I want to hear from you on school selection, on their goals, but also just, yeah, overall, like, what do you make of this? And it's kind of an unusual profile to be a doctor and then a McKinsey consultant. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And clearly the highlight of the profile is the fact that they were a medical doctor that obviously well qualified got the four you know the, the first class degree um, was a was practicing medical doctor made the transition to McKinsey that can't be trivial um, and I would assume they've been doing some really interesting things at McKinsey which has sort of inspired them for this um, MBAs to get the sort of the business fundamentals to then um, switch into sort of healthcare tech VC type stuff. Now, it might be that they want to look at that goal, uh, maybe investment banking is a little bit more re- realistic in the short run to then transition into um, VC sort of related stuff to get that sort of finance training and, 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 and the fundamentals. That might make things a little bit more palatable um, or, or at least a little bit more realistic um, in, in, in that sense. Um, so, so maybe just tweaking their goal a little bit, um, would help. Um, but other than that, I mean, their extracurriculars look decent. Um, I would go all in on Harvard, Stanford, Wharton round one as they're, as they're planning to do, um, with, with the recognition that if things don't work out well, there's, there are several other top um, M7 programs that might well um, work for this candidate, Kellogg, for example, um, with, a, with that sort of strong healthcare focus, um, with, a, with a decent finance program, which sometimes gets overlooked because of their strength in marketing. Um, but but um, but yeah, I think quite honestly, Graham, this is probably a pretty high caliber candidate. Yeah, I, I'm kind of like I have sort of two points of view. On the one hand, I'm like, wow, doctor worked at McKinsey, applying from the UK, which is a market that's woefully underrepresented at the top kind of US MBA programs. So there are all these pluses, plus first class honors or a four O GPA. Um, I, but then on the other hand, I'm kind of like, well. That 326 is not going to jump off the page. It's sort of averageish for Wharton and HBS, below average for Stanford. Um, I, you know, it's probably fine given that they did so well in school. Um, but again, just not jumping off the page. And then the goals, like you were saying, the goals sort of stuck with me because I was like, wow, you don't go from a doctor and a little bit of consulting right into VC. You know, most often you'd have to pass the investment banking, as we always talk about. So I think, yeah, some refining of the goals to develop a more rational kind of short-term goal that then ultimately maybe leads them to that VC promised land would be smart. 
And the last thing I would say is just like you're saying, think about expanding the scope. I mean, sure, apply to the trilogy in the first round, but then what about round two? And I would argue, they mentioned they want to be in London. And so I was thinking, you know, well, LBS should be on this list. And, you know, potentially, I don't know, if they're thinking about healthcare and health tech, MIT, or, you know, just, I'm trying to think of schools they could add in a second round that are very top schools that are also very well known, both in the U S and abroad. So MIT came to mind. And and then the others you mentioned, you mentioned Kellogg and stuff. So yeah, just expanding the scope might be smart. Um, but again, I, I love this candidate overall. I just want to make sure they address these potential pitfalls. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So, uh, I want to thank that person for sharing their profile and also they had some dialogue with you, which made this easier for us to kind of, um, understand their goals and stuff. Uh, let's move on though and talk about wiretaps candidate number two. So our second candidate this week uh, is a a really interesting candidate in that she's a kind of humanities background person. She didn't say which, whether it's, you know, English lit or a language or what, but humanity. Do do you ever watch Big Bang Theory, Greg? Yeah, a little bit. I've seen some episodes, yeah. Sheldon, the humanities? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's, yeah. But so I'm a fan (laughs) of the humanities. And so this person, um, she went to, she doesn't say where, but she says either Harvard, Yale, or Princeton for undergrad, had a 3.6 GPA, then did a master's um, also in the humanities uh, at a top school in the field that she was focused on. And she had a 3.9 in her master's. Um, She's taken the GMAT and got a 645, which for those of you who are still getting used to the new and old GMAT, that's about a 690 on the old test. Um, So a little bit below average at top schools. Her GRE, which she also took just without sort of preparation to sort of see where she would land there, is a 322. Uh, She is thinking about, Alex, maybe taking MBA math uh, as a way to kind of bolster her quantitative side. She also mentions that she'll have like six years of experience when she matriculates, and she is a little worried that she'll have too much experience. She mentions that all the deferred enrollment candidates, like from you know places like Harvard, where there's this two plus two, she's like, they're all going to be 24 years old or something, and she's wondering, is she too old for an MBA? Um, her work experience state has been in kind of... Um, sort of finance and um, financial analysis, I think. And then she also, though, prior to working for the um, finance role she's in now, she did a stint at a startup and also worked as a reporter. Um, So a little bit different. Uh, Her short-term goal is to go to MBB. And her long-term plan is she needs to take over her family's business uh, located in the Midwest where she wants to land. Um, And I believe it's like a family kind of manufacturing business. Uh, I don't have the list of schools that she's targeting because I I don't have that in front of me, but I believe it was sort of a mix of top 16 schools, if memory serves. So, Alex, what what do you make of this candidate? Yeah, I mean, I think there's one weakness here that she can can absolutely try to overcome. And other than that, I think, again, a really interesting, strong profile. Um, So the 645... GMAT, the 322 GRE, that's definitely going to be up slightly on the weaker side. I would wonder what the quant score is in, in both tests. Right. Um, and I absolutely think, first step, do that MBA math. They really want to show Adcom that they've got the self-awareness to recognize that as someone that studied the humanities <laughs> at the undergrad and master's level, perhaps not so much quant work in those degrees. So bolster that up um, and, um, you know, so, so, so absolutely do that. If she can come back and retake the, the GMAT, just nudge it up a, a few points, that would make a big impact. Same as if she, she prepped and, and took the GRE and sort of bolstered. Uh, I don't think she needs to be in the first round. If, if that's the question um, that she's struggling with, you know, I don't have the time because I've got to do a, a bunch of other stuff to get my applications ready, then I would pull back on a few of the applications targeting round two, maybe one or two into round one, knowing that I can then prep and, and spend a bit more time just bolstering the test score. Because I think if she does all this stuff, um, you know, I, I, I think she's probably got some pretty interesting 
um, experiences, you know, when, when she, she adds up her reporting experience, her startup experience, her banking experience, um, etc. And as long as she can come up with a cogent narrative in terms of the steps that she's made, the whys in terms of her switches and so on and so forth. Um, her long-term goal, family business, so, so that will sit well with Adcom, I think. She's got somewhere um, absolutely to go. She Hopefully she's passionate about that um, and, and so on and so forth. So a lot to like here, Graham. I really hope that she is able to uh, mitigate any concern in terms of her quant profile. Yeah, and you had mentioned in the comments that you were thinking she should be looking at a couple of schools in the Midwest too, I think, that, yeah. that were not on her list. Yeah, Kellogg and Ross. Yeah, so I, I think that does make sense. And, and Kellogg happens to have a real strength in family business. Yeah. Um, they have like a little family business center. So does Wharton, actually. Um, those are the two schools that I think of when I think of family business. But I I really, I, when I see this profile, I know that admissions officers are going to be rooting for her. Yeah. Um, so for a number of reasons, female, uh, qualitative kind of background, but then you get into this issue and it's great that she's working in, in banking now and finance and stuff. But I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Take MBA math or business fundamentals, like one of these courses to demonstrate both an awareness um, of this weakness and a readiness for the core curriculum in business school. And yeah, to the extent that she could boost one of her test scores, I think it would really help. Otherwise though, I think everything makes sense, you know, going to consulting in the short term and then taking over the family business. I mean, it, it's all fine. And yeah, really interesting candidate. I'm rooting for her. I know the admissions readers will be. So she just needs to make sure that she kind of ticks these boxes that would be potential concerns. Very good. All right, so I want to thank her for sharing her profile, um, and yeah, let's um, let's move on though and talk about Wiretap's candidate number three. So our third candidate this week uh, has an interesting background too. You, you pick some, as always, Alex. You pick some great candidates. So this candidate um, is a military candidate who then finished their military service and joined a defense contractor. Uh, this person has a 3.2 GPA uh, from undergraduate. They took the GMAT focused edition or the current GMAT and they scored a 665, which again, if you're curious and are trying to equate that to the old score, that's either a 710, 720, depends on the percentiles. They're mostly targeting top 16 schools. I think the they have like one M7, which is Columbia, and then they have a handful of other top 16 programs. They... Uh, want to do consulting after business school and then maybe get back into something in the defense sector. They have limited extracurriculars, they mentioned. I mean, obviously, while they were in the military, that's very understandable. But they do say that they're a marathoner, um, so they have that going for them. But Alex, what do you make of this kind of Because it's, you know, one of the things, first of all, is that they're military, but they've already transitioned into the private sector working for a defense contractor. Um, but yeah, what do you make of them and the numbers and everything? I mean, this is kind of an interesting case. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've picked up an interesting point there. The majority of military candidates that we see targeting top business schools are coming straight out of the military to get the MBA to then start their private sector um, experience. So this candidate has a couple of years in the corporate sector. So I assume that experience has has allowed them to recognize, oh, okay, an MBA would be really useful in terms of you know, my career trajectory um, going forward. Um, and I think that, that can add to their overall profile. We don't know a lot about their actual military experience. I think if we got a better sense of that, this could this candidate could come across as being a super strong candidate in terms of that military and that corporate experience combined. Um, so, so you know, let's let's presume that they they do have a strong sort of military profile. Um, their numbers aren't jumping off the page, but again, I don't think they're bad at all either, right? Six sixty five, three two GPA. Um, so, so you know, their numbers won't guarantee them a spot in in in, in a top program, but that sort of in, in complement of, of strong military experience, and then hopefully. The, the corporate experience is, is also similarly strong. They can show impact and growth in, the, in that corporate experience and stuff. Um, that'll be helpful. I'm not sure about this marathon stuff, Graham. I did it once. I think it shows a little degree of insanity, but um, <laughs> it also shows a lot of dedication, um, a lot of drive, a lot of personal whatever. So there's definitely lots to be 
um, squeezed out of, of, of being a, a, a marathon. A, 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 yeah, having gone through the experience once, I can I can say <laughs> that 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 is not the experience for a typical person. So so yeah, quite frankly, Graham, I I do like this profile. Um, and you know they're they're looking at top sixteen programs, so so I think that's that that's very fair. Yeah, I don't, so they have Cornell and Columbia yep. and Tuck, Duke, MIT, uh, NYU and Darden, and, oh, and Yale as well. So those are the schools they have on their target list. Um, I, yeah, I'm a little. I guess I'm a little more cautious here because I'm concerned about the numbers. I think. You know, obviously, it's good that they're not only applying to like M7 schools, so they are casting a slightly wider net. But I would argue that they might need to even look further afield and and make sure they have, you know, it depends on how urgent it is for them to go off to business school, obviously. And they could, you know, we've talked about them applying in the first round to some and then see where the chips fall. But yeah, I just feel like, I mean, I just don't have enough information either, right, on that. Like, so maybe that 3-2 is from West Point or something, in which case that looks a little different. Um, so I don't, we don't have that information, unfortunately, but I, I do, I hear you when you're saying there's a lot to like too. I mean, I think, you know, this is obviously, a, there's a lot of potential. I just, the numbers give me a little bit of pause in terms of how competitive they might be at say a Columbia or a talk. Um, but, but I guess we, you know, they'll see, they can apply and there's, there's obviously no, no big rush, um, as a military candidate, that's not like they're overrepresented. And I think, you know, I, I know you think running a marathon's insane and stuff, but I, I hopefully they, you know, that's something that they, if they're a marathoner, as they call, you know, referred to it, they, they're regularly kind of running. Maybe they belong to a running club or they, you know, have raised some money or that for charity. I mean, there are all kinds of things that one could associate to running that would make that a more robust kind of extracurricular potentially. Uh, but yeah, this will be interesting. I mean, I would love to know answers to the questions about, you know, the quality of the military experience and all these other things we're talking about. But yeah, we'll see how it goes for them. Yeah, yeah. But I think one of the key points is they can target the programs that they're targeting in the first round. Yeah. And if they're not successful, they can come in in round two. They, again, as you said, they're not overrepresented. Right. So this whole idea they've got to get all their ducks in a row in round one, like in maybe an Indian tech person has to do. They don't have to do that. So, yeah, yeah. that's fair. Um, well, in any event, I want to thank them for sharing their profile and for their service. Um, so, yeah, Alex, great, g- great kind of dilemmas this week because each candidate had these kind of sort of two, you know, sort of like, you know, the first one we dealt with was, you know, sort of, um, you know, the kind of doctor and consultant. Then we had this sort of humanities reporter person who also is a banker. Um, and now we have the kind of military person who's also already in the private sector now. And so a lot of like rich kind of career backgrounds um, to discuss today. So really interesting stuff. Uh, let's do it all again next week, um, if you're willing. And yeah, we'll see everyone next week. Very good. Best of luck, everyone. Stay safe.